this is a conspiracy. That's what this is. Just begging to course its way through your veins. Let's just for a moment speculate, shall we? You're into comic books, aren't you? I'm a nerd. But you do like comic books. Comic books aren't just for sad nerds anymore. Do you think we need one more? Strange things are afoot at the Circle K. Do you think we need one more? Objection, calls for speculation, move to strike. This is a bad idea. This is a bad idea! All right, we'll get one more. <laughs> Spectators, a comic book podcast with Jake and Jesus. What's going on, Spectators, and welcome back for this, the 87th episode of Spectales. And unlike the holy hand grenade of Antioch, thou mustn't worry about counting to three prior to lobbing this comic book bomb into thy ear holes. We are your noblest of hosts, Sir Jake with glasses, and my co-host, Jesus, also known as Sir Beardalot. Uh, how art thou, Jesus? I haven't been called Sir Beardalot since, I think, what, the, the 16th century, somewhere around there? I mean, this is like a mantle that gets taken upon by people, and, and it just so happened to choose me this time, so I'm very grateful for that. But uh, I'm surprised you didn't go with the 86. Um what is it called? Intro or or, or uh, anecdote anecdote that we just talked about? Hey, I just on issue. <laughs> hey, I I I was really feeling the holy hand grenade of Antioch, so I I rolled into that, uh, and then you know Twitter got a hold of me with uh, with um, Monty Python and everything, so I just went with it. Uh, for all you listeners out there, if this is your first time listening to Spectales, thank you for giving us a listen. Uh, Spectales is a comic book podcast that asks collectors and creators, what is your grail tale? Each week, we explore new stories about the comic book grails we love, the epic journeys behind how they were obtained, and how they inspired new creativity. We also dive into some comic book speculation and how, as collectors, we can help the hobby pay for itself. So this week, I am very, very excited to really jump into this episode uh, with a full steam uh, going here because we have a very special guest on. Much like Jesus and myself, our guest this week is a father, and he is really into comic books. However, that is probably where the similarities between us begin and end because unlike Jesus and myself, our guest is an Eisner-nominated comic book writer responsible for crafting some of the most beloved comic book character stories. Uh, I mean, for people like Superman, Green Lantern, Hulk, Alien, just to name a few. Uh, he is also a master sergeant in the United States Army, an incredibly talented and accomplished musician. And from what I've read on the internet, he's a pretty damn nice guy. Uh, he is Mr. Philip Kennedy Johnson. Philip, welcome to the show. What's up, guys? Thanks for having me. Thank you very, very much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for joining. We're super excited. Um, Jake didn't know who you were. I, I put him onto you, even though. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That is very much not true. I was calling you PKJ uh, back when Jesus was in diapers. So before it was cool. Yeah. I gotta say, Jesus has got. You guys have got some good t good t shirts going on here. I'm pretty impressed. You got your own Spectale shirt and Doom 2099. That's not like I don't think I've ever seen one before. It's badass. Deep cuts, man. We're we're about, we're the deep cut podcast, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think you'll find out here soon. Enough. <laughs> Most impressed. Uh, I I also commented on Jesus' shirt. It is a badass shirt. Jesus even knew which cover it was, which was also uh, I didn't know. He knew which one it was. I I got to give him mad props for that. Uh, so, but this is not the, uh, well, it sort of is the Jake and Jesus podcast, but today it's actually the Philip Kennedy Johnson <laughs> podcast. So we need to get more into, into you. Uh, so I, the one thing that I was so excited about when I reached out to you, uh, I swear to God, I have been not off of, but I've been more into indie comics for a long time. Our listeners, this is not news to our listeners. I have been slowly migrating away from the big two, not not necessarily just because I absolutely loathe and hate all of the writing. In fact, I, I do dip back in and I will follow along. But honestly, some of the indie stuff has just been more appealing to me. I also get into more of the horror stuff. And, uh, so I, I, I know, you know where this is going, but I had to reach out to you after I got a hold of the Hulk and w I'm going to get into some questions in a minute, but I couldn't go any further into this conversation without saying thank you very much for what you're doing on that Hulk run. Uh, it's, it's pretty astounding. 
Thanks, man. It's a huge honor. I mean, I when I got the call to do that book, I um, I mean, I've got my Hulk runs that I think are super dope, but I'm not like the, I'm not the guy who buys every Hulk book. You know, like I'm not a. That's if I was going to pick pick one touchstone story, that would not be the one where it's like it's, it's Hulk. I got to have it. I'm usually I usually follow uh, creative teams. Um, as I imagine you do as an indie guy. Yeah. I mean, if you're into indie books, you're following your creators, right? Yeah. And that's kind of how I approach, whether it's big two or indie or whatever, I'm kind of looking for the people. Even if it's somebody I didn't know before, sometimes I'll get, I'll get turned onto a book due to the concept. If there's like a really kick-ass high concept, I'll pick something up. And then if the if the creator's doing it for me, then they'll kind of go on my good list and I'm still looking for them everywhere. Um, but Hulk, man, like when I got the call to do that, I had just given up my beloved alien yep. before that. And I fucking love alien, man. <laughs> like I was, it was really hard to let go of alien. I love those movies, love writing that book. And I was just so underwater. Um, I feel like I was like, I was just coming up to the point where the cracks are going to start to show on my work. And I was, just, I was just afraid I was going to start face planting on books. And I was like, no, man, I, I really, I don't know. I was I was having to kind of dig like what do I want to what do I want to do next on this book and trying to trying to figure it out. The, the story was not like telling itself the way it did on those first few arcs. Sometimes it just like springs out. He's like, I know what I want to do. It's got it's legs and it starts and running, wait. right? Just yeah. yeah. Sometimes you have to kind of dig around and find it. Um, and I was I was just doing grossly too much stuff, and um, it was it's it was just feeling like too much work to find the next thing. I was like, I don't know, man. I've had two good years on it. I'm really happy with what we did it. With what we did with it, I, 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 I think I should leave while they still want me to stay. You know. Yeah. So, so I did two years, and I and I stepped back. I was like, I'm really sorry. It, the, the call with the editors was like to discuss what we're going to do next, <laughs> and I was like, actually, I think I need to quit. Um, and I, it really, it really hurt. That was the first time I've ever let go of a book. Like, like, um, yeah, first time I've ever stepped away from something. And it was, it was my only Marvel book at the time too. And I was kind of nervous, but I was like, fuck man, I feel like I'm making a mistake here. Like I'm, this could be the last Marvel book I ever do. And, and right when I let it go, um, I went to New York Comic Con like right around that time. And there was like a, it was kind of a Marvel party that they do. Yep. Uh, I forget the name of that place. There's this bar they always buy out and we, we hang out there. Although it was, it was like right after COVID. So it was in this, this weird little shack thing outside. And, uh, and I was out there with the editors and the creators and, um, I was talking to Jordan White, who's been at the time had been editing the X stuff, but I knew him from Marvel zombies. Yep. And he was like, um, I told him that I had just left alien and he was like, oh man, does that mean you, does that mean you're not doing any Marvel work right now? I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm not. And he's like, oh no. And the way he's, it was nice to hear that. It was nice that he gave a shit. Yeah. But it was, but it did also come and it kind of made me wonder, like, how did he mean that? Did he mean like, oh no, we're gonna, yeah, you know, I really want to see you on books, or is it like, oh no, you're out now? <laughs> like, what is, you know, what does he mean? Am I screwed? <laughs> um, but right after that, I got the call from Will Moss. He was like, hey man, I know you're, I, I know how busy you are, but would you want to do Hulk? And I just couldn't, I didn't expect that call. First of all, I mean, because Donnie had been doing it, and I didn't know that he was leaving. Like, this is before this was all like, yeah, public out there that he was, that he was leaving those books. It seemed like he just got started, and I was like, ah, uh, I don't know, man. Let me think about it. And I, I didn't know what to do at first. I mean, I thought Immortal Hulk. I mean, the the Donnie run, the Starship Hulk thing, was such a Donnie take. Like it was this very like bombastic, yep. and superhero-y and just like just a kid smashing toys together and have a ton of fun and huge visuals and amazing art and just big fun concepts that happen really quickly and it just felt very much like a Donnie set book. pieces. Lots of them. Yeah, totally. Like the, <laughs> honestly, probably my favorite part of that whole thing was like writing that might've been that first issue where it was like, um, it was just introducing the concept of Hulk fighting stuff in his mind, like turning up the rage meter thing. Forgive me. Have you guys read that book? Uh, yes. yeah, I started so that's uh, okay. Sorry, right. I'm, sorry. I'm the I'm the guy who in and out. So I'll be full fully honest with all the listeners. Dude, it's still yeah. I I did not. I'm not throwing shade at all. I've never read Doom 2099, <laughs> so I, I'll own that. <laughs> um, yeah, like I there's just too many books for everyone to read everything. So I hope that it wasn't taken shitty. Um, but I, in that first issue, there's like the the rage meter thing in his head. Like the, he turns up the Hulk's power. By making him angrier and angrier, it's like a little, like a literal, like, oh, okay, cr like crank, okay, yeah, and um, 
and he's, he has to fight bigger and bigger threats. And at some point, and, and they're, they're cool and just very Michael Bay over the top stuff, you know, <laughs> bigger, and bigger bosses. Yeah. Yeah. At one point he, that's uh, he has to fight giant sized Wolverine. <laughs> and it's, you know, when we hear, when we hear that, of course, we're thinking about a giant sized Wolverine comic. But he's fighting a literal giant sized Wolverine. It was just a really fun, I think I a really that, fun reference. That visual. Yeah, it's a fun reference. It's like the original Wolverine costume, and it was just that kind of stuff. Anyway, it was very clever. But um, but as we're discussing, horror kind of has my heart. And um, I thought Immortal Hulk was perfect. Um it, it just it um it goes back to the Hulk origins, like what the Hulk book was always supposed to be. It was always meant to be a monster movie kind of thing. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde slash Frankenstein. Yep. Like it was supposed to be a departure from the kind of stuff that Marvel was doing back then. And then through, you know, team ups and and creators, it kind of it kind of found its way back into the mainstream Marvel stuff and it became sort of, you know superhero. You join the Avengers, these it became more of like a superhero type thing again, but it was meant to be a, a monster book originally. And Immortal Hulk just steered right back into that so hard. I mean, even the the original thing where Hulk came out at night, that was something from the original Hulk stories. Hulk was this thing that happened at nighttime. Like when the sun went down, Hulk came out. That was part of the original Hulk story. Um, God, there is so, so much nighttime in your stuff too, which is, I <laughs> yeah. love it. Love it. Yeah. Thanks. I, uh, man, the, the biggest, when I was, uh, when I asked Will to give me some time to think about it, um, the biggest challenge was to figure out like, what am I going to do with this? That's not just aping Al and Joe. Like, what am I going to do? That's not just, cause that, that book's perfect. Like, what do I do? That's not just copying this other thing that I love. Cause it has such a, to me, it just nailed it so well. It just kind of dominated my concept of what Hulk is after that. It's kind of hard. Like imagine Swamp Thing, not creepy. You know, like it's just, it's kind of been, Swamp Thing's kind of been defined now yep. by just the stories that have come. And that um, the Immortal Hulk thing just kind of sucked all the air out of the room and kind of defined what Hulk is. And uh, so I just kind of let it percolate and I read a bunch of stuff that I love. And that's whenever I have like quote unquote writer's block, that's not really what I have, but I, um, I kind of find my way out by just consuming great shit. Yeah. Just, just reading great stories or watching great stories or playing a great game or find just consuming great storytelling of some kind. And I did that. And, um, I found my way to Hellboy oh, basically. And, and I just love the way that Hellboy just kind of, he is this kind of lightning rod for folklore and horror, like cosmic monsters and all these things. He just kind of, he just kind of walks the earth like came from Kung Fu and these, these, <laughs> uh, these amazing things just kind of gravitate around. Like he, he walks through stories of folklore and cosmic horror and, um, you know, creepy legends to which the rest of us are blind. And I just love that setup, man. I love that he is, he tells himself he's one of us, but he's really one of them. Yeah. Um, I just love that take and I love that vibe. I love the blue collar monster hunter kind of vibe. Um, one story in particular called the, the Crooked Man, Hellboy the Crooked Man, that was written by Mignola, but drawn by Richard Corbin. Oh. Man, it is just so good. I I can't I can't handle how good it is. I love the vibe of it. I love the it's like this folk horror thing. Um I, I just love it. So things like that, like the it's a, it's, a, it's a witchcraft story basically. But then other, there's also other like single images, like him fighting this, this ancient vampire or, or uh, carrying that like half a corpse over his back on a rope or like just these, just these creepy, awesome images that just are just so cool. I'm already getting um, these images in my head of what Hulk is going to be fighting uh, coming up yeah. in the series. <laughs> it, it's, it, it, it's giving me, it's giving me goosebumps. Also, I noticed, uh, Hey, Zeus and I both picked up a pen and wrote something down when you uh, named the <laughs> Hellboy the Crooked Man. I have a feeling yeah. we're we're both putting them on <laughs> putting that on our reading list uh, pretty soon, dude. Yeah. I can't I cannot recommend it much higher than that. I um, it's great, dude. And if you if you want a, a picture of what's coming, it's that. I it story like hell stories like Hellboy, Hellblazer. Um, there's this great um, Beowulf translation that I love or adaptation, I should say, by Garcia Rubin. It's brilliant. Um, 
I I don't even have a copy because I keep giving it away. Oh, really? Uh, uh, that must be. Yeah, I've I've had I've had like three or four copies and I keep giving them to people. Oh. I need to get another copy, but it's it's unbelievably beautiful. Um, very art driven, and I try to let that be a lesson to myself too. Like just remind myself that it's the visuals that do it, and I. I just constantly try to put Nick Klein, the artist, as front and center and just just give Nick every element that he needs to make magic because he's he's doing the best work he's ever done, it, like hands down. He'll tell you the same thing, too. I, yeah, I mean, I can tell you, at least for me, you know, I, I you know, Jake does a lot of indie. I do a lot of indie as well. Uh, but I also like I follow too. I like Donny Cates. I've been following him since Venom and then some of his indie stuff and things like that. So I followed him and I followed him into Hulk and. Hulk is one of those characters for me that's been around for a very long time. He's been somewhat defined, like you mentioned, how Ewing was, you know, that was a great run. But like yeah. you mentioned, Nick Klein, man, that artwork, I think issue three, which I, I just read again, was just like, it was crazy, right? Like, that's the best way I can describe it. But you mentioned something, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to ask, because I like talking about craft and, and picking brains of, of creators. You, you've mentioned a couple times and you kind of mentioned a little bit here of, of you know, expanding and making things bigger or, and keep it growing. I think you the thing you said that they asked for a 12 issue and I think you, you turned in like 36 issues or something at some point like <laughs> yeah. for the pitch. Right. So my question is, is around that craft piece is how do you how do you keep building and making it bigger? Because like for me, like when I have a story in my mind or something or when I'm thinking about something. I have it focused and it's like, I want to tell this story right here. Right. And then, and it, for me, it's like difficult to like, okay, well, let's just make it a little bit bigger. Like for me, I guess I just get, what is that called? Tunnel vision, I guess. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you do that where like you just can continue to expand? Um, for, well, that it's different for each story, but for that particular story for Hulk, um, I knew what I wanted it to be. I, um, I wanted after at least sitting with it for a little bit, I knew what I wanted it to be. I wanted it to be like Hellboy walking the earth. Um, but for the but with a very different kind of theme underneath. Like the the one thing that's missing from well, it's not really I don't know if I can really critique Hellboy that way. But um there's a I wanted there to be a there's gotta be a, a point to the whole thing. Like why are we telling the story? And it can't just be because, you know, current still comics or because Hulk is cool or whatever. Like, what's the point of it? What's the what's the theme? What's the thing underneath the whole thing? Um, so with Hulk, I mean, the brilliance of Hulk, if you've heard me talk about Hulk before, you've heard me say this, I'm sure. Um, the brilliance of Hulk is in its simplicity of concept, but that it also gets more complicated the deeper you look into it. Like it's it's a it's a premise that is so simple any little kid can get it and and think it's cool but you can also it's also like a book club thing where you can like really dive deep into it depending on who's creating it and what their what their story is that they're telling it can be about their own rage issues or their own daddy issues or their own issues with child abuse or addiction or um god man being bipolar or relationships or whatever. And the story that I wanted to tell, um, well, I, I wanted to make sure it was about the movie monster thing, like from a more mystical side rather than the black science side that, that Al explored. I thought that was, that was going to be the big thing to set this apart from Immortal because Immortal was all like black science. Um, and I wanted this to be more like rather than, you know, um, forbidden laboratories. I want it to be more like potter's fields and, you know, the you know, monsters from the bottom of bottoms of rivers and um, hangman's trees coming to life and just like just mystic stuff. That particular thing with the hangman's tree is not a story that I know of yet. I just kind of, that kind of came out of nowhere. I don't know why I said that, <laughs> but now, and so if you see it in the story now, it's, it's got conceived of at this moment. Oh, nice. uh, oh, now we're, now nice. we're praying for that to happen. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So a different kind of take, right? But um, so now like I need to um, – with that aside, I wanted to figure out um, what the theme is. And the theme, um, since it's about monster movies I, – I mean monster movies, I think of stuff like The Ring or It Follows or Smile where the <clears throat> the monster is the thing that's, that's like inside the main character like stalking them. 
you know. It follows. And that's kind of terrifying. Yeah, love that movie. Right. It's, it's creepy, right? <laughs> smile even more yeah. for me, smiles like Ugh. <laughs> I thought that was I thought that was really haunting and effective. <laughs> um, like just this, this thing you just can't escape because it's like it's already in you. Like, what do you do? Yeah. So I and that's totally the, the banner situation. So I wanted to approach it from a theme of addiction. So the, the whole thing of um like you, you know, you're, you're on the run from this thing, this compulsion that you can't control. Like if, if only I could fix this thing about myself that I hate and that hates me, I, everything would be okay. If I could just get myself under control and then you fail and you black out and you wake up the next day. It's like, what did I do last night? It's that kind of thing. I am um, just this thing that's inside you that you can't control. I mean, all of us, whether, I mean, I have never, thankfully, I've never had to struggle with like substance abuse. I've never been an addict, but I've known a shit ton of them. Yeah. And I know what that's like. And I do have things about myself that I try to keep under to keep contr in, under control. You know, I think we all do. We all have something about ourselves, like whether it be like whatever, gambling, overeating, you know, anger or, um, you know, even if it's something, some dumb little thing like oversleeping, it can be something that really plays a huge role in your life that you just can't get a hold of. So I wanted this to be that. Um, so, so you got the theme, you know what it's about. So you got the, the big picture thing. And then you've got, you have to figure out the framework. I knew I wanted it to be like the Hellboy or Hellblazer setup where this person is kind of this lightning rod for all these stories that come out of the, the woodwork. Because I also love when I was reading Marvel as a kid, I loved all the really short arcs, like one issue, done, or two issues, done. I think that's dope. And I miss that. Yeah. Where now, if you jump in an issue four of something, you're kind of screwed. <laughs> like it's, <laughs> you know, you have to get yeah, now. Well, now I got to wait for the trade, you know, because I don't know what's happening. I want people to be able to jump in and, and be able to just like pick it up. So I um, and actually that might be of interest to you guys as a as a speculator podcast. I mean, there's going to be constant jumping on points, constant first appearances. Like every couple of issues, there's something new coming out. Love it. So like the like brother deep, brother deep, and sister Sadie in issues two and three, never been seen before. So now they're out there. Yep. Something new is getting like uh, the Swamp Witch in issue four and five. Um, there is a um, we're bringing out a new a new Ghost Rider in issues uh, issue six. Nice issue six, seven, and eight is this World War Two era Ghost Rider. Um, and there's also this creature called the War Devil in those issues. Although that actually, yeah, that'd be a first appearance. Like my first Marvel story ever was a War Devil story. Um, just a little 10 pager, but it's not an actual monster though. It was more like a concept. That's another story, <laughs> but um, it's like a, it's like a PTSD um, metaphor basically. Oh, wow. But, but in, but in Hulk, I'm bringing it back out and making it an actual creature. That's pretty cool. Oh, that's cool. It's, that is pretty good. Like I'm fleshing it out. I'm really proud of that's... it. It's going to be super dope. And what and issue, really what issue so, yeah. is the war devil? Six. Six, seven, and eight. Yeah, and that's that's the first appearance of World War II era Ghost Rider as well. And I got bigger plans for that guy. Nice. Hey, so wait. you're gonna dig it. He's got no. He's got an old Steve McQueen era motorcycle, Jeez. like a 19. Oh. What is it like 1942? The Great Escape. Early, I think. Yeah. Yes. Nice. Yeah, it's that kind of stuff. Um, nice. Anyway, oh. sorry, I I got way off track there, Jesus. You asked me about um, how to tell a bigger story. I kind of started with the big story. It's like, what's the setup that can give us. A, uh, I promise all, everything I've been answering has been leading to this answer. So uh, we need something that's going to give us an endless series of jumping on points with new creatures coming out of the woodwork to, to try to take down Hulk. And that led me to the mother of horrors. Um, so that is the thing that is going to, that's like the big bad at the end of this, at the end of this road, whether it be 20 issues, 30, 40, 50, a hundred Mother of War is kind of the end. Is kind of the end. The end point. Yeah, and Eldest is a huge part of that too. Um. So I kind of had that frame. So um, the mother. So on one hand, you got addiction, the concept of addiction, and just uh, Banner and Hulk being at odds because of the events of the Donny Cates run. Um, Charlie, the girl, being kind of the uh, the character that both of them play off of. So they have you can see her have different relationships with both of them, yep. with Hulk and Banner. Uh, so you've got your character stuff to keep it interesting. You've got the framework for the big comic, you know, the serial monthly comic thing where something new is happening all the time. And then you've got the kind of the mini arcs over the course of the whole thing. So uh, basically in every mini arc, like every two or three issues or sometimes one issue, 
uh, the characters end up in a slightly different place at the end of every arc. So like at the end of issue one, Charlie and Hulk find each other at the end. And then you've got issues two and three with Brother Deep. At the end of that, throughout those two issues, Charlie's like, take me with you. Hulk's like, no, fuck you. You're puny. You're, you're, uh, you're Banner's friend. <laughs> and she's like, Poopy, fuck you. I hate you. Uh, and they, they end up getting in the whole big adventure with, with Brother Deep. By the end of it, Hulk kind of takes a shine to her and it's like, all right, fine, you can go. But he's not happy about it. And Banner doesn't want her to go. Like Hulk has, Hulk and Banner have different feelings about it. Issues four and five. In issue four that just came out, we see a little, we find out a little bit more about Charlie's past. And we find out that she now they're after her for the death of her dad. And she doesn't understand the, you know what really happened. So she's out now they're on the run. So every every little arc, every mini arc pushes our characters forward just a little bit. You know, so there is there is still the big, the big long ongoing arc that you get from it. But there's also the uh you're just getting the little adventure that anyone can just jump on. If you're just a 12-year-old looking for a Hulk story, you can just grab a book and have two issues and you're good. You know, I know that's the longest answer ever. I hope it's of some no. Oh, it's no, fantastic. It, 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 Basically, it, 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 if uh, if your story, if you look at your story like an ice sculpture, you can't just scalpel it to death. You know, if you get if they deliver this gigantic ice block in your driveway that's the size of a Volkswagen, you can't get out your scalpel and get started. All right, chainsaw first. All right, just get <laughs> the big stuff first. <laughs> yeah, chainsaw first. Like, figure out what you're trying to build, and then take think about the big stuff, like theme. What's it about? What's the framework? And then you think about, you know, this, and then you get out the the chisel after that, and think about like slightly small. Okay, what's the what's the monster for these two arcs? Who's the well, or really who's the artist for these two arcs? <laughs> and then you figure out like what am I going to give Travel Foreman that he could do really great, or Nick Klein, or whoever's next. Um, and then think about the monster and think about the setup and then so all the way down to chisel to a uh, scalpel. Or big, big funnel, little funnel. Exactly. Well, like a tree growing sideways, like, so like big idea and then more complicated as it goes. I, uh, Hey Zeus, we're going to call the first part of this podcast, uh, the Philip Kennedy Johnson, uh, masterclass on writing yeah uh, because seriously, I, seriously, driving man. some <laughs> mad knowledge is so good i'm very excited oh. uh, i'm excited to just go back and edit it just so i can re-listen because even though i lived it uh i'm too busy taking notes i i gotta re <laughs> i'm gonna have to re-listen uh well it's kind of you to say i mean i know i know it's not really what this podcast is about per se but you know that's that is my answer to his use of question that was a long one but no and i I don't want to give you some bullshitty thing like, oh, just write what you write what you love, man. No, it's, it's, it's what uh, you know. We, it's a craft, you know. You gotta. We do get into craft on this. Hey, Zeus is always oh, always great about getting into craft, especially with creators, because one, everybody kind of has a dis different approach, and we like talking about those sure. different approaches. But also, uh, you know, it, it it's great information for us as as Hey Zeus and I make no, uh, uh, we're not shy to say that we are. Um, aspiring writers of sorts uh, of different of different kinds of things. So yeah, we 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 do our best, or we're trying anyway. Uh, <laughs> so we do. We're gonna do something the same, but also a little bit different. Hey Zeus, we've never done this before. We do need to get into our very 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 first segment. Technically, it's the second segment if you include the master class. Uh, but let's jump right into that one real quick. Pickups. That's right. The recent pickup segment. What's going to be a little bit different about this one, hey Zeus and and Philip, if you're okay with that, uh, since we went over so much of the Hulk already, uh, and that was going to be a big portion, I think, of what I at least I was going to ask you a lot about uh, within this first segment. Let's do a little bit of a rapid fire. Uh, in recent pickups, Philip, we always go over something we recently picked up, read, collected. It can be just about anything, uh, and uh, so we'll, we're we're going to go through that. Hey Zeus, you traditionally go first. So what do you got? All right, man. I'm gonna tr try to keep it brief with the rapid fire indie book. Um, and just, just like from my like quick background, and I hate to say it because I've read some of his stuff, but I, I just feel like it's 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 very uh, high level, and and we we've talked about it too. And we think we talked about it with our friend of the show, um, 
Um, oh man, friend of the show, uh, 20th Century Men. Oh, Dennis uh, Camp. Dennis, Dennis Camp, yeah, Dennis Camp. It's just very high level stuff, very, very, very high. So Ram Ram V and Andrade in Rare Flavors, which just came out. Uh, I read this book. This book is is it's just really good. I mean, that's all I can say about it. I mean, you can even in the, this I think this is a variant cover. I don't know if it's the the, the first cover or not. Uh, there's a couple other ones. I bought another one that that was foil that was really cool that I bought. Um, it, it has like an undertone to it of something's off, right? And it's about food. And I was I just thought it was interesting. It's about food. Uh, we talked to uh, Kieran Gillen about music, right? Within um, the the writing, and then Philip Kennedy Johnson also has music, right? In music, your background as well. You've been you know in, in music for a while, and now this is food. So just just it's just interesting, guys. I, I don't want to say too much about it. I want to give it away because uh, there's some stuff that that is given away in in issue number one. But pick it up; it's really good, uh, and it's my recommendation, my recent pickup for the, for this week. Who published that? Uh, Boom. Boom Studios. Boom. Yep, yep. There you go. Cool. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, what do you got, Philip? You know the most recent stuff that I bought. <laughs> You know, think I'm a chump because I I get this stuff free anyway. But I, um, <laughs> but usually it's usually it's via PDF. I mean, if I ask them to send me hardcover books, they will. I just feel douchey doing that, I guess. <laughs> so I um I was just in the shop and I uh, there's a bunch of DC stuff that looked really good. And I've actually <laughs> some of the stuff I have the PDFs. Like my friends will be like, "Yo, it's, this thing's coming out." Um, you know, give me a plug if you like it or something. So I, but I, sometimes I don't finish the whole series. Like I tend to get really swamped and don't finish. So I picked up a big stack of DC stuff the other day that all looked really great. And I've been looking forward to finishing and I just haven't had a chance to read it. And I like having the volumes too, because I leave all the stuff to my son. So, um, so sometimes I'll buy books just because I want the physical volume, you know? So anyway, again, I'm telling long stories. I got, um, I got Batman, One Bad Day, Two-Face <clears throat> by Mariko Tamaki and uh, Javier Fernandez, Jordi Blair. Yep. I got the Human Target, oh, yeah. uh, Volume One hardcover. That's great. I got all the Chip Zdarsky Batman stuff because I'm not cut up. So I bought the Knight, and I bought the first volume of his um, of his actual run, the Failsafe book. Um, let me think. I've been. I went back. Oh, I bought the. Um, I bought the Dan Waters, Ricardo Federici, um, Night Terrors Detective Comics thing because those guys are my friends, and I, nice. you know, it looked super dope. So I wanted them. I have not read that yet, so I picked that up too. <clears throat> um, I guess I could actually show you some of these. Oh, Sorry, here's Human Target. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Human Target. So that, good. Yeah, there's so much. There's so much on the yeah. shelves. It's it's gonna be hard to. Yeah, to Ricardo. Read. I just Ricardo's art is just incredible. That's his cover too, of course. And he he drew the Last God with me. Yep. And um, man, he's just incredible. I will say he's he's hard to color, man. Like it's any, any, anyone who has to color Ricardo has a hard gate. Like this cover, I'm pretty sure Ricardo painted this himself. Um, and he prefers to color himself. Like this is, mm. this looks like it's almost certainly a physical painting that he did himself. Um, but if you actually look at his interiors, he does a lot of the texture in the pencils. And in fact, his stuff is typically not inked. It's so clean. It goes straight to color from pencils oh okay oh. just because of the his just line re- work is just so intricate is that just so unbelievably clean yeah but it's um yeah it doesn't you don't really need to ink it <laughs> but it's i mean i say you don't need to but if you zoom way in i mean no pencil will be quite as it's not like goes from strip like stark black to white pencil like there's if you zoom way in there's gonna be that smudgy shit between right yeah. so um but he adds so much texture in the pencils that when it kind of it's like this problem for colorists to solve kind of huh. it's like do you just like do you just flat it or or what like how do you do it without without washing out the pencils so it's tricky um and i you know i'm always curious to see how different colorists handle it um i hadn't thought anyway, much about beautiful. that when it comes to colorists and things like that but that does yeah it's a how different colorists handle it is the same way as how different artists handle uh, different scripts, right? Like it's, it's, it's just another yeah. part of that, that process. Cool. Yeah. It, as a, as a musician, it kind of makes me think of like adding that texture or shading in the pencil stage 
it kind of reminds me how sometimes, um, depending on how, a, in, a, in a jazz combo, sometimes uh, the way that a bassist or a piano player or even a drummer, if they use a ton of bass drum, can kind of muddy up the waters a little bit for their collaborators if they're not careful. Like it's um, the, like if you're playing with a bassist, if you're a pianist playing with a bassist, um, you don't, you shouldn't be playing the bass on the bottom. Like you should be leaving, you should be voicing it, leaving space for the basses to play the bottom stuff on their own. And you should be, you should be starting your chords from like the middle of the chord somewhere. And sometimes pianists will play, they're just so used to playing by themselves that they will play as if they were solo, like as if they're doing everything. And then the bassists are like, get out of my way, Jack. <laughs> um, so Ricardo is such a genius of an artist. Um, it does sometimes introduce an, uh, an interesting element to like a it, it may, an interesting uh, element to the collaboration with the rest of the creators. It's a challenge. Certainly yeah. a challenge. Now I want to interview uh, some colorists that have uh, that worked with him. We, we we we've we've talked about them, and we need to get a colorist on, man, because it's such. They they it's are they are elusive people, right? The the writers and yeah. the artists are a little bit more <laughs> prominent out there. Uh, the colorists seem to be a little bit more elusive. Uh, to yeah, get dude. a hold of unsung heroes. So yeah, for sure. There's, there are some, that are a little more prominent. They're getting a little, that are more accustomed to the spotlight. I mean, Dave Stewart, of course, is a rock star. Uh, Jordi Belair has become that way as well. Uh, she's very, very well known. Dude, Matt Herms has been doing my stuff on action comics and, um, man, he's great. He just does such great work. This is a great collaborator. Um, see Matt Wilson, is doing the Lord's work on Hulk too. I've just been really spoiled. All those guys work so well with their, with their line artists. I've been really, really fortunate. Yeah. The, the first one that would come to mind for me would be Chris O'Halloran, who uh, does a lot of my favorite, favorite stuff as well. He, he seems to be literally just everywhere as well. Um, I think I, the one that comes to mind is uh, Mike Spicer to me. Cause he, him and uh, oh yeah, Danny Warren Johnson have this um, like, weird collaboration and I just kind of want yeah. to know what it's about. Yeah, man, that stuff goes together great. Mike is, yeah. I don't know Mike Spicer, but he is he's color. see, what is it? He just colored a, a backup story in one of my action issues. Uh, so we're on the same email thread, but we have, not, we have not interacted. That's not actually my story, so we haven't been talking. But, uh, but he's doing great work on that book too. Nice. Colorist, getting the shout out on, on Spectales here. We, we can't say we've done that a whole <laughs> lot. We should do more of that. Uh, so for my my recent pickup, uh, it, it was going to be the Hulk. It was going to be uh, listen a few, I, I, it, you know, literally like a month and a half ago. Hey Zeus was just like, hey man, you really need to pick up the new Hulk. And I was like, really? And he was like, dude, it's just straight horror. Like you, it's your it's your thing. You have to pick this one up. Uh, and it wasn't like I had just given it no look at all, but it it just. It, it's it's never the first thing that always jumped off jumped off the shelf. Uh, I will be the guy who the the guy I'll own up and say, listen, I was the guy who told Mark Wade I didn't really like Superman, uh, and I <laughs> not not the smartest thing to tell Mark Wade. By the way, cool move. Uh, yeah, cool move by me. I wasn't trying to be a dick. It uh, so with dude, it's okay, man. Like there's so many you, yeah, there's so many characters, so many books. You're allowed to not like stuff. Uh, he didn't see it that way. Uh, no, he was he was very cool. About it. <laughs> but with the Hulk, he, 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 go ahead. <laughs> I said he just challenged Jake to read his run on it. I did uh, read his run, by the did, way. What, what he did different on it, and but yeah, go ahead. It, it worked yeah. out. It, it worked out for the best for everybody. Uh, with Hulk, we've really touched on so much of it, but I really wanted to maybe ask a couple of questions if I could, just to maybe real quick. So with, yeah, I, I, we've talked about it being horror, you know, all of the elements with it's dark, all, you know, so much of it is at night. Uh, you're bringing in a lot of the horror elements that uh, as a horror reader, as a horror fan, movies, everything horror, I love it. So you're bringing in all these elements. I mean, literal, you know, corpses, zombies, so to speak. You're, you know, the, the, the mystic, as you said. And I immediately, early on, excuse me, I immediately, early on, was like, are we going to see Man-Thing? Because this is Man-Thing territory. 
And then, <laughs> and then lo and behold, in the most, I was like, oh, okay, we're going to get man thing. Uh, and something that I wanted to bring up is you've in the past also written, uh, on Swamp Thing. Uh, and, and, and I, I guess we've talked about man thing and Swamp Thing on this show multiple times. And I will always say everybody could use a little man thing in their life. Uh, and, and I, I, I guess I wanted to know, like, while these characters share a lot of similarities, they share a lot of differences and they share a lot of differences, especially in how they've been used and how the characters have grown since their inception. So everybody can say that they're very similar, but I, I would argue that they're very different. But in this case, um, both in their monster, almost monster movie elements, um, do you feel like with uh, Man Thing entering this storyline, and I know you've got a lot of other characters you're going to be utilizing going forward, this is so much his realm, it almost feels more appropriate as a Man Thing book than it does Hulk in some ways. Uh, but I guess, did you immediately know that you were going to bring Man Thing in, right? Like from the get? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, um, I'm trying to balance the, um, the beloved characters that everyone knows and wants to see with the, the very obscure characters that you don't see anymore that I kind of want to bring back with the new stuff. And I'm, I'm mostly introducing new things. Um, but I'm trying to also, you know, uh, give some fan service for, you know, I want to bring out stuff that people are like just anxious to see. And I knew that man thing would be top of that list. Yeah. Um, Ghost Rider is a personal favorite of mine that I wanted to bring out, but there's also another, I love the Jason Aaron Ghost Rider and how um, he introduced the concept of all these different ones over the years and all that, which makes a ton of sense. And that's not like, I don't think that originated with him, but it's, but he really kind of went down the rabbit hole with that, like showed the, some, a little more of the potential for that idea, I think. And it opens the door to a, a very specific story that I want to tell with Ghost Rider. Um, so yeah, and Man Thing, Ghost Rider, both top of the list. Um, I like the Moloids. I kind of want to bring them out. <laughs> and so you, you see them at the end of issue one too. Yep. But I, yep. just like a little, just a little, just a little nod. Well, they, Although that. These are two in the, uh, in the, um, uh, the annual. Correct. Right. Well, that's what I was going to say. They, I, yeah, I was planning on using, uh, well, I can't do it now. So I'll just tell you, I was going to do a thing with the Moloids and uh, the missing link. Remember that guy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't see missing link much anymore. Like, or literally never. He's like this, He's the this missing mutant link, looking yeah. thing. Um, I kind of wanted to, I had a very clear idea of what I wanted to do with those guys. Um, but then David told me he was using it in the annual or using them, using Moloids rather in the annual. So I was like, well, I don't know. I don't want to bring them back too soon. I want to wait until it's, um, I would have used them sooner if it weren't for that. But now because of that, you know, it's a, it's a big shared universe. And I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, do something that doesn't make sense with what David just did. Um, so I'm going to wait a little longer on the Moloids. But that aside, it's kind of cool to see how the people like upstairs at Marvel are kind of energized by this. Like, Hey, could you bring out so-and-so? I'm like, hell yeah, we can <laughs> just figuring out what we're going to do. And like, yeah, it's fun. It's like, we're all just kind of nerding out. Like, what if we did this and this and this? That's, um, that's I, I will say by nature, I am, I'm finding myself pulled more in the direction of the new stuff constantly. Like I just want to do new monsters. Also. I got, man, God, the one for, for issue nine and issues nine and 10. I'm so excited about those. I mean, I can't say it's, I can't say I'm more excited than I am for the, for the Ghost Rider War Devil thing, because that one's very personal to me, but, um, Are you allowed to I've got tell all us these who ideas it is coming. or what it is? 9, 10? Well, I guess I can do whatever I want. Um, <laughs> should I though? We won't tell anybody. This is just between us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> nice. Just I see the red light. <laughs> yeah, we're just, yeah, just, just, just bros talking. Um, yeah. All right. It's called Frozen Charlotte. Frozen Charlotte. Um, yeah, we'll leave it at that. Hey. But I will say that if if you Google that term, that is the you can see what it means. It's the, it's a it's a term for a specific kind of china doll, like porcelain doll. Oh God. 
It's like uh, <laughs> if, if you look up, if you can get frozen Charlottes at uh, like an antique store, like a, it's kind of like precious moments from a hundred and something years ago, like these mm. little, little baby looking dolls. So instead of like a rag doll with a porcelain head, it's just a, it's just like a solid porcelain doll. It's usually very, very tiny. Um, but that's the, that's the name of a, of a creature I'm bringing out for issues nine and 10. And man, is it cool. I'm really excited. Dude. It's not one of those. It is not one of those dolls. It's a reference. Like there's, there is connective tissue with the idea of the frozen doll, the little doll, but that's not what the thing is at all. That's uh, it adds a lot of lore to, uh, to the Marvel universe. It adds a doorway to the next chapter. It's going to be the last issues of that trade. So it's going to lead to the next big thing, the big dramatic thing with Hulk and Charlie. Oh man, right. it's gonna be it's gonna be fucking cool, man. I'm really excited about it. <laughs> I, well, so you 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 mentioned real quick. I'm sorry, Jake. You go ahead. You go ahead. Because you, you mentioned real quick the juice set that you're getting from the above. You know, hey, do this. You know, can or can you can we do this? Well, you know, on our level, on the ground level, you know, I can just tell you there's juice there too. I guess if you want to call it as juice, because I went to two um, local comic shops today that are probably 30 miles apart. And the issue issue four sold out on both of them. Um, oh. So I, I have a, a pool box at a different LCS. So I know mine's waiting, but I went to two different ones and they weren't on the shelves, man. So, you know, well, something's, some, something's going on. I mean, that's great. It's also not great. I'm sorry people can't get the book. Like yeah. I kind of, I kind of hate hearing about sellouts just because I was like, man, I want to get one, but I mean, it's great. I'm glad it's, I'm glad it's selling well, of course. Mm -hmm. Um. You know what? I'm going to I'm going to do something really stupid and I'm going to I'm going to make one little admission like issue five. Um, in part because of the collaboration with the like, you know, every every comic that you see on the shelf is, uh, is a collaboration between different creators. Right. And between um, the way the collaboration went and the little decisions and trying to get everything to fit into the into the 20 page page count and all these different little things, there is not as much man thing in that issue as I would like. Um, so I'm already trying to figure out ways to bring man thing back in again. Like there's more, there's more I want to do with him. So, uh, I, I, yeah, I fully endorse that. I love man thing and <laughs> I can't wait to have more of it. Just the, his entire backstory, all of it. Uh, and the fact that he would debuted in with one in a book with one of the greatest covers of all time, uh, which Savage Tales, uh, it just right. makes it, makes me love it even more. Uh, well, Okay, so thank you uh, for sharing all of that. I seriously, to echo what Jesus said, uh, I, I got in late, as I admitted to earlier. Uh, book number two, I had to read digitally, I, I, and I don't mind reading books digitally. I, I usually also am kind of doing both at the same time, but in order to catch up, uh, I had to get variants of two out of the the four books. Um, just to uh, just shucks. look at that. Yeah, there's. Oh man, he's got some nice stuff. Yeah, I got. Uh, man, and that that one, uh, Jesus, could you hold nice? Jesus, could you hold up the ones you just held up? Uh, oh, I haven't Good seen one. that one. Which variants you got oh, there? That one, yeah. So this is the Stormbreaker variant with the. Uh, oh Stormbreaker. right, right, right. Yeah. Now, could this I? Could you hold cool. the other one, please? Oh sure. That's a, an interior page. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, it's just it stupid is, how good. I mean, every dude, I, I regularly get pages from Nick that are interior pages that look like they should be covers like all the time. Yeah. I mean, the, the detail on it too. It's just it's stupid. You see how like his arm back there is human. He's got the human arm. Oh my God, he does. Because he's changing. So yeah, he's th there's in the middle a lot of, the of transformation. The, the the yeah the body horror stuff on it is really cool to me and I think that's one of the things that that I told Jake about that I was like dude I, I don't I've never like yeah like in, in the Al Ewing run they did some of that um kind of body horror stuff but this is just different this is like this reminds me of horror like movies and stuff like or like oh, man you know practical the, effects kind of stuff like that in issue six issue six has the you can tell your your listeners this too man uh, issue six has the gnarliest transformation that hulk has ever done in a book hands down <laughs> nice i'll take that to the bank dude there's, there's never there's never been a, a rougher transformation than this one <laughs> and i'm trying i'm gonna try to keep leveling it up too like i i love love deeply love the one in the in issue one yes and uh, i know exactly and the one in the, i mean 
the one at the end of issue two was was concise, but it was also super cool. Um, so much of it issue... feels like it's just being fought, right? Like like Banner is yeah. fighting it so much, which is making right. it even more difficult. Uh, like it looks like a battle every time he's changing. It right. looks like it's a it's an absolute tormented battle between both. Yeah, yeah. Hulk's trying to like Hulk is trying to take over their body person like permanently. Because of the events of the Donny run, he's trying to like I, you know, I've had enough of this. Like you, you enslaved me inside my own mind. Now it's going the other way. Like he intends to lock up Banner in his own mind forever. So every transformation that he takes over, like every time Banner has started to get away. So that, like that while uh, while Hulk has control of the body, Banner is inside this hellscape in his own mind, trying to escape, trying to get out. And when he finally gets out, then he's like running in real life, trying to escape Hulk. Of course he can't, and it's this big struggle constantly. But I, yeah, I mean, that, that transformation, man, um, sometimes we're used to, like in the Ang Lee movie, which I actually like, he just, the, his whole body just kind of like swells up. He's like, now he's really big. And it's like, no, no, I want to see, like, this would be horrifically painful. <laughs> You're right? taking I mean, it to a this... werewolf level transformation, right? Yeah. Like that's, that's. Yeah. What... You want to. Yeah, I want to see a body change that that really embraces how rough it would be. You know, like I in this end up in the script in that first issue, I talk about Hulk's teeth growing out of his mouth and pushing out his his human teeth. Yes. Um and um you know, his you know, Hulk's eyes, you know, like suddenly boom, they're there and like you know, blown out his orbital sockets and everything's like, "Oh, Jesus." Uh, a collarbone's like suddenly sticking way out and when he gets when he when he changes from Banner to Hulk, he gets bigger from the inside out, and so everything's just kind of like exploding. And then when he and when he changes back to Banner, he contracts from the outside in. Yeah. It's so there's stuff coming where you see like uh, like skull plates like crunching in and like stuff squirting. It's, it's rough. It's real rough. You know, I want to see saggy skin, and it's I, I want it to look and feel like it should. Nice. You know. Yeah. All right. Well. I think- Cannot wait for that. Also, guys, I want to give a round of applause to everybody sitting here. We did such a good job with that rapid fire on, on that on that segment. Uh, we'll, I, we're gonna, uh, Philip. We, I know time is somewhat limited and everything like that, but we can't let you go without doing a grail tale. Do you mind if we get into that our our next segment? No, please. If we if we need to do an actual rapid fire, we can do that. Too. Well, the Grail Tale, we, we just want we got it. We have to. We ask everybody this question. So let's get into that that next segment. Grail Tale. Grail Tale. Grail Tale. Grail Tale. That's right. The Grail Tale segment. We ask everybody who joins us on this show to give us their Grail Tale to talk to us about their comic book Grail, uh, whatever it might be. And uh, in this particular case, the man sitting in that seat is you, Mister Philip. So, what what do you got for a Grail? Well, uh, when you guys give me an example, of what you mean by Grail, though, like something like you would love to have, or something you do have and 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 love, something or, that like, you have that's precious to you. We we usually leave it fairly open to interpretation. So we talked about Mark Wade earlier. Mark Wade selected. He owns the original artwork from a specific page in Superman five hundred, I believe it was, and he has oh, it cool. hanging above his desk. And anytime he needs inspiration, he always looks up to that specific page, uh, and uh, and that was. That that was hit for him, uh, but other people have talked about specific things that they really, really want that they would love to have. Uh, we consider that a little bit more of a whale, a white whale kind of thing. But in in, in this particular case, we try not to uh, exact too many rules. Yeah. Um. Uh, man, I've got a few. Uh, but I one one that's sitting right here. Oh, convenient. Is a, a, a statue, and I don't, I don't, I do not buy up like figures or action figures or figurines or anything. I just don't, I don't, it's not where my heart's at, but, um, but there is this figure from dark Knight returns. Oh, I see him. Oh, nice. Like oh, the, wow. the, uh, the Batman Superman fight at the end where they're kind of fighting on top of the, like they're in crime alley fighting. Yep. Oh yeah. 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 That's really and cool. In this, in this statue, they're on top of the remains of the, the bat tank. Yep. And oh, you see, yeah. if you look inside the thing, you can see Carrie Kelly inside with a with a slingshot. Holy shit! Yeah, <laughs> that's that pretty cool. The detail, yeah, on that is incredible. Yeah. yeah, I know it's amazing. I love it. 
So I, um, my home store is Third Eye Comics in Annapolis. And it's, I, I, it might be one of my favorite. It might be, it is certainly my top three comic stores in the world of anything I've been to. I mean, Forbidden Planet in Glasgow is pretty unbelievable. But, but man, Third Eye Comics in Annapolis is just un, unbelievably cool. And I saw that statue there. Um, before I had written anything, that before I had gotten anything published, I was like, oh my God, this is incredible. It's also kind of expensive, at least for, sure. um, you know, I just, I just don't spend money on that stuff. So to me is, I kind of, kind of saw some sticker shock. I was like, man, I don't know. But when you, but when creators sign there, they get this, this standing 40% off discount that day. So I was like, mm -hmm. someday I'm going to, I'm going to get a comic made. I'm going to sign it at Third Eye and I'm going to buy that fucking thing. And uh, that's what I did. So I have that. So it kind of represents that first book, you know. That's pretty um, awesome. That is my that is my only statue that I have in the house, except for a couple of things that came with like special edition games. I got a couple of Arkham City type things. Um, I've also got um, a page from my first ever finished comic, uh, which was a web comic called "The Lost Boys of the U Boat Bremen," and that was drawn by Steve Beach, the guy who at at the time had done nothing. He was, I just found him right out of SCAD. He just graduated from Savannah College of Art and Design. Hadn't done anything yet. Uh, and I wanted to do this black and white webcomic series because I, I mean, just, you know, I decided I was going to really try to do this comics thing and um, I wanted to show that I was legit. So um, I wanted a webcomic that I was going to, I was going to publish a page a week, every week till it was done. I had this big five issue thing I wanted to do. I didn't want to pay a colorist because I was already going to pay, I was paying this guy a fair rate. Um, and I was going to really, I mean, it's all out of pocket. So I didn't want to pay for colorist, but I also didn't want it to look like the shitty black and white version of the thing that would look better in color. Mm -hmm. I wanted, I want the black and white to lend itself to the story. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do a period horror story set in World War II on a U boat where black and white just makes sense for the story, you know? So it's basically Ridley Scott's Alien meets Lord of the Flies on a U boat where they get trapped under the ocean and there's this, they find out there's this, supernatural thing down there with them and it's in, in the dark and it's cramped little space and um it's at the end of world war ii where uh, the germans were running out of warm bodies so they were they were recruiting they were drafting old men and teenagers basically to fill their armies and subs so you got the sub filled with like german kids basically who are all scared to death and they're all down there and it's Anyway, so that's the story. Super, super bleak, but it's also really cool. And Steve is just this savant for horror. So he uh, he gave me a page from that book, and I've got it framed on the wall here. Oh, wow. Mm, Holy shit. Nice. It's this stone, like, idol is that? that is in yeah. – it's in uh, – like, you see one of the crates in the background. It's got, like, the Nazi eagle on it and everything. Mm -hmm. This thing was in one of those crates and it's, they find it and they, they didn't know that it was on the ship and there's something in it and it's, it's, you know, something's leaking out of it. And so it's this ancient idol and there's writing all over it. It's, it's an actual language that I made up that Steve then <laughs> like drew on the thing. Like you could, if you had, you know, 10 years, you could decode it. <laughs> um, so I put a lot of love into that page and Steve did too. It looks incredible. There's like, like legit ink spatter that he like oh slapped God. on the page. That thing is horrifying by the way. Uh, I know, yeah, right? The visualization, We I may have to ask you for a, like just a, a phone picture of it or something. Cause I think we might want to share yeah, that. Sure. That is actually that whole, that whole book is still on my website. If you go to Philip Kennedy Johnson.com. Yep. There's a, there's a web comic there. There's two web comics still on that, on that site. One is called killing Marcus, which actually became the first issue of my scouts comic series called smoke town. So that first issue is still on there for free, which is 22 pages. Um, but there's also the Lost Boys of the U-Boat Bremen, and that's 110 pages. That's my first comic ever. It's a little wordy, so be gentle. That's my first comic. <laughs> but uh, the whole thing is just the journal of this like teenager Nazi kid, and like this this horrible thing that happens. So ah, oh, there it is. I found it. I found it. I will be reading it. Uh, awesome. I hope you. I hope you love it. His art, man, is and you know I'm gonna. I'm going to show you one more since I am, I am he of the long answers tonight. I'm going <laughs> to take you downstairs, my basement here. I'm loving it. Forgive me if the, hopefully the uh, 
internet does not cut out. I'm on Wi-Fi here, so we'll see what happens. But Steve Beach is now the guy who drew Lost Boys, the U-Boat Bremen, is now the guy who um, who has been painting my Action Comics covers. Yes. Um, he, <laughs> Steve, I just, I constantly, that dude has a career because of me. I constantly put his work in front of people <laughs> and they're like, oh my God, who is this guy? I'm like, I know you got to use him. And so he gets this work. So now he's doing all these covers at DC. Um, and he did the cover for, um, Superman war world revolution that let final like that, that one shot mm-hmm. that, uh, that ended the war world saga. And uh, I bought that painting off of him. So I've got it framed now. I'm going to show it to you. Holy shit. Isn't that amazing? Oh, my God. The guy with no grails has all grails. This is ridiculous. (laughs) Seriously. (laughs) Isn't that great? He's like, oh, what what do you guys... Think of grails. Well, I just have these, and it's like that these is awesome. A, that is amazing. Well, I don't have that many. But I do have these, and I actually just, I just bought another one too. He also did my um my most recent arc that finished on Action Comics called Rise of Metallo. Yep. And he did a bunch of cover. He did all those covers too, and the Action Ten Fifty Six cover. I bought that one as well. I actually have not yet hung it. I just got it. Oh, that one's cool. So this is not a print. This is the original art. These are physical paintings. Holy yeah. shit. They're kind of big. They're like, looks like roughly 18 by 24 inches. Yeah. But that's- I mean, you know, just the, just the artwork They're that's, they're that size. So anyway, yeah, there they are. But this, but this war world revolution cover, man, to me, that represents the end. Like the war world sucker went on a long time. It was, a, it was just about a couple of years. And, uh, I don't know. I'm just extremely proud of it. It's like my mission statement on what Superman is, what he represents. Um, what humanity can be and should be, what we should aspire to be. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm extremely proud of the War World Saga and uh, that cover to me kind of represents the work we all did together on it. And did I hear you so. compare it to Frazetta? Did I hear you say that? That painting, yes. yeah. Yeah, that that had uh, it looked like if Frazetta had done a su- uh, had done a Superman cover. Yeah, totally. Uh, I, and that was always meant to be kind of the, the mission statement of it. I wanted all the covers to kind of look like that. Steve came on board as the cover guy um, just about right then. I can't remember if that was his. That might have been his first one for us, actually. Hell of a first one. Uh, yeah. yeah. Seriously. <laughs> well, we, we constantly talk about uh, like Creepy Magazine and, and um, Eerie and, and Frazetta has all of my favorite covers from from Creepy um, and it just love, yeah. love all those. those that's, that's another huge influence on Hulk. Actually, the creepy area. I have those hard covers here too. And those are also a big influence on what's coming in Hulk. Yeah. That, that's cool. Nice. All right. Well, uh, then that I, I hate to, to cut you off if you were going to continue, but let's, let's finish this thing up. Um, we'll, we'll do very rapid fire on our final segment. The speculation segment, and this is the one where we're going to rapid fire a uh, book, collectible, something random that that we feel is either underrated or just should be, you know, another look at it. And uh, now, Philip, you've kind of speculated uh, or given enough uh, fodder for speculation on on the Hulk run, probably to to last a lifetime for some speculator out there. Uh, so no pressure on on having to say any more. Uh, hey, Zeus, though, what do you have for speculation this week? Um, man, I, I'm so happy and I'm so glad that you mentioned Alien at the beginning of this because I'm just like you. I, I like Alien. I like, you know, Predator. I like, you know, all that stuff from the beginning till now. I read a bunch of the Dark Horse stuff. And now, obviously, I got back into it with the Marvel stuff, which is your stuff, right? And it, it makes me feel good that you're a fan of it because you got to write it, which I mean, obviously, I have some questions around, like, how was that? But right now, I just want to talk about issue number five. Uh, of Alien, uh, Philip Kennedy Johnson's run from July of 2021. It's the first full appearance of the Alpha Xenomorph. Um, so it's the first appearance, something cool, something different in the Alien. Uh, and again, this is Marvel now who has ownership of it, um, of the franchise. So I'm not saying that something could happen with this going forward in, in, in some of these movies that may be coming out, uh, but 
I mean, they've they've shown us in the past how these Marvel heads that they dip into the the comics a lot, uh, the recent comics a lot. So that's going to be my speculation. It's a four dollar book right now because um, it just came out in twenty twenty one. Uh, but read that whole run, man. I've been enjoying it. I've been reading it. I'm up to issue, I think it was seven or eight. Uh, but I, I just I just started reading it, I think, last week, whenever I found out some information about two deleted uh, endings to Prometheus. Uh, one from the um, storyboard artist who talked about it. And then the second one in the, in the um, what is it, the, the Blu-ray, the director's cut or something like that, it had a different ending as well for Prometheus. Um, so when I saw that, I was like, huh, let me see what Marvel was doing with Alien. Looked it up, started reading it on digital. Really, really good, good run so far that I've been reading. Uh, so you can pick that up as well, but also Alien number five for speculation. That's what I got. Thank you, man. All right. I will go next here. Uh, and I alluded to this earlier. This should not come as a shock. Uh, it's probably not even the first time that I've speculated on this book, but I'm going to say it again. Savage Tales magazine number one, uh, which is the first appearance of Man Thing. And, and I mean, for the speculation purpose, Man Thing, it's first appearance. But this is in th- for me personally, this is a top five cover of all time. Love the cover. I have a copy myself and I'm, I'm already considering getting another one. Like I will love it that much. Uh, there is one down at my LCS that is a really nice copy, but they want too much money for it right now. So I'm not buying it yet, but someday I might. Uh, so yes, I, the it, man thing and based on the Hulk run and, uh, you know, uh, PKJ literally just solidified. He wants to do more <laughs> with man thing. He didn't guarantee it. Everybody. He did say he wants to. Uh, so that's based on those words. I'm telling you right now, everybody should put this in their collection. Uh, if only just to, to have the cover. So that, that's what I got. Uh, nice. I'm going to throw out another, another mention of Hulk number six, Hulk. incredible Hulk number six <laughs> for all kinds of reasons. First, first appearance of World War II Ghost Rider. First appearance of the War Devil. Um, gnarliest Hulk transformation of all time. So far. <laughs> that, that, I mean, that's, yeah, that's a pretty good, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm not going to pull this, but I'm, I'm kind of excited about it. There's going to be, um, I'll, I'll show you guys a black and white picture, like a zoomed in shot of a part of that page or something. Um, let's see. Issue number nine, two men, Frozen Charlotte, but also... Another character that's not a villain that I that is going to be recurring for sure. Cool. That's in nine. Plot thickens. Yeah, that's in nine. Oh my god! Just I cannot wait. I don't know. See, I've gone from not you know not I've gone from not reading a lot of Marvel or DC stuff for that matter uh, to literally it is my most anticipated book every month now. Uh, oh it, man! One hundred percent true story. I cannot wait for five to come out, dude. We didn't even talk about uh, Green Lantern, which that's I I know. Oh, thanks. I just hit. Yeah, I just hit like yesterday. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's that's another one. Yeah. Um, I wish we had more time. Yeah. So well, you know what? We'll co- <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll get you on again. Uh, we yeah, will. We'll, do it again. Uh, we'll we'll talk again. We'll do uh, whatever we need to um, to to get more time with you. But that is going to do it for this episode of Spec Tales. Uh, all you spectators out there got a absolute treat. I, this might be one of my favorite episodes we've ever recorded. And I'm saying that in the middle of it, yeah. but it, seriously, it was awesome. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, uh, Philip. It was, Thanks, guys. it was so it was much fun. Yeah, it's my pleasure. It's great to meet you guys. All right. That, no Thank you. that's it, everybody. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Please come back next week. Uh, otherwise between now and then have a good week. <laughs>